So welcome, everyone. Welcome to our conversation, Gun Violence as Public Health Crisis. I'm Michelle DeMarzo. I'm the Curator of Education and Academic Engagement here at the Fairfield University Art Museum. And we are excited to present this event as the keystone of the programming for the exhibition that is on right now in the Walsh Gallery, Unload, Guns in the Hands of Artists. If you hadn't had a chance to see this fantastic show yet, it is closing on October 13th, so make sure you get over to the Walsh Gallery. And I'll throw out there that on Tuesday at 5 p.m., we will be welcoming artist and social activist Bradley McCallum to the Walsh Gallery to talk about his art and his work, so please join us for that if you can. We'd also like to thank again our wonderful partner, the Unload Foundation, for helping us bring this timely and provocative show to Fairfield University. And now I'm going to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, the wonderful Melissa Kwan, who is director of the Center for Faith and Public Life here at Fairfield University. Uh, the center's work focuses on harnessing the academic resources of the university to affect positive social change in and with communities. Melissa completed her master's degree in education at Fairfield University with a concentration in service learning and civic engagement in 2005, and she's currently pursuing a doctoral degree in higher education leadership at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. I'll hand it over to Melissa to take it from here. Thank you, Michelle. And let me echo uh, Michelle's welcome to Fairfield University tonight for this important and timely conversation on gun violence. Uh, tonight's panel is uh, the second in a two-part series. So last week, we focused on viol gun violence in Connecticut, um, discussing the policy landscape, opportunities to work with manufacturers on gun safety, and the role of street-level interventions that involve peer networks in reducing gun violence. Um, this week, we're going to turn our focus to the national level, um, discussing gun violence through the lens of public health. And we're incredibly fortunate to have guests that can speak from multiple angles and depth of experience addressing gun violence through research and evidence-backed interventions. So the paperwork on your seats includes bios for each of our speakers. Um, I will share a few highlights as I introduce the panel as a whole. Um, following the introductions, I will invite each panelist to speak for five to eight minutes um, to lay a foundation for our ongoing discussion tonight. And the following the opening remarks, I'll pose a few questions to the panel before opening it up to audience uh, questions. Um, so also on your seats are comment cards. We ask you please to write your questions on those cards and ushers will come around to collect them bef before the audience Q&A. Um, if you don't have a card, just write it on, on any old piece of paper. If you don't have any old piece of paper, just raise your hand and we'll make sure to get one to you. Um, and we hope this will allow to make the most of our conversation tonight. So to introduce our panel, we have Dr. Patrick Kelly who has been working here at Fairfield University in the capacity of Distinguished Fellow in Nursing and Health Sciences since 2006. During his brief period, he designed an interdisciplinary major in public health, which is currently enrolling students. Prior to his time at Fairfield, he was director of the Board on Global Health and founded the Forum on Global Violence Prevention with the Institute of Medicine. In this position, he co-authored the 2013 report, Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. We have Dr. Bradley Stolpak, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Chicago School of Medicine, where his research and practice focuses on developing trauma-informed programs and services. Among his many innovative roles, he serves as clinical director of Healing Hurt People, a violence intervention model in Chicago that aims to address the psychological trauma caused by gun violence. And then last week, we have Jim Himes, who represents Connecticut's fourth district in the United States House of Representatives, where he serves on the House Committee on Financial Services and Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Creating vibrant, safe, and healthy communities for all children is a priority for Representative Himes. And so kicking us off tonight will be Dr. Patrick Kelly. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate the invitation. Uh, Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times has noted that more Americans have died from gun violence since John Kennedy's assassination than the number of Americans who have been killed in all wars since the Revolutionary War. Every day, an average of 96 Americans die of gun violence. Typically, about 34 are murdered, and about 56 take their own lives using firearms. 
Despite this burden of death, many don't see gun violence, though, as a public health problem. However, public health contributes complementary methods and solutions to the criminal justice approach. In contrast to public health's achievements with problems such as AIDS and tobacco, the politics around firearms has blocked for over 20 years almost all federally funded public health gun violence research. Vast gaps exist in what we know about risk and protective factors, about causes and potential interventions. National data comparable to what we know, for example, about motor vehicles or about certain communicable diseases does not exist for firearms. Several laws explicitly prevent the US government from having a nationwide system of registration for guns, owners, or gun-related transactions. And this uh, legislated ignorance handicaps scientific evidence-based policymaking at the expense of public health. Misperception also distorts how we frame the problem. For example, while assault weapons dominate our fears, 95% of firearm deaths are still due to handguns. Among firearm deaths, roughly two-thirds are due to suicides. In the United States, the annual number of gun-related deaths hovers at about 35 or 36,000. In Connecticut, in 2016, uh, we could claim about 172 of those. The collateral psychosocial impacts, though, on society of gun violence go well beyond those who suffer the kinetic impact of injury. A public health approach puts the emphasis on preventing disease and injury through understanding the interrelationship between an armed perpetrator, the victim, and the environment. The perpetrator may be dangerously psychotic or depressed or under the influence of drugs or alcohol or otherwise morally compromised. While gun control may affect the hardware side of this deadly pairing, the human side offers opportunities for public health to change this perfect storm. A victim's susceptibility to the perpetrator's evil can be mitigated. Uh, for example, alcohol seems to make a person more susceptible to gun violence, whether it's homicide, suicide, or un unintentional injury. This has led, for example, to impactful uh, efforts to close bars and other uh, alcohol-serving establishments uh, early. Other related behaviors, such as gang membership, social isolation, uh, substance abuse, or domestic disputes, can all be addressed through systematic strategic public health engagement. The direct burden of gun-related mortality is actually similar to what we see with motor vehicle accidents, with Parkinson's disease, and with poisoning deaths. Yet, gun violence receives less than one-tenth the research funding of those conditions. Consequently, rather than the evidence-based debates that we've had for decades concerning controversial aspects of AIDS or tobacco use, gun violence prevention has been stifled. And I believe the congressman's going to say a little bit about uh, what's behind that, the so-called uh, Dickey Amendment from 1996. In public health, we care greatly about health disparities. CDC defines health disparities as preventable differences in the burden of disease, injury, violence, or opportunities to achieve optimal health that are experienced by socially disadvantaged populations. Well, the United States is apparently a socially disadvantaged population. The rate of gun murders in our country is seven times that in Canada, 23 times that in Australia, 90 times that in the United Kingdom, and 361 times that in Japan. According to the Pew Research Center, 42% of Americans keep a gun in their homes. Now, the vast majority of these folks are law-abiding persons who have a right to self-defense and to own a gun. However, it's a shame that so many Americans perceive a need to have a deadly weapon nearby to feel safe. As someone who spent 23 years in the military on active duty, I find myself wondering how many of these Americans are actually proficient to effectively use the weapons they possess, and how many actually face a reasonable prospect of mortal danger 
where a gun would give them the upper hand rather than being a net liability. Uh, firearms have a deep root in our culture. However, when it comes to preventing suicide or femicide, household proximity to a gun is not particularly desirable, since split-second impulses can have especially deadly consequences. Merely having a handgun in the home increases the odds of suicide by a factor of about six compared to homes with no guns. Keeping a loaded weapon in the home increases the odds of suicide by a factor of about nine. About 50 women a month are killed by a current or former intimate partner. The partner's access to a gun increased the odds of femicide more than five-fold. Given the dynamic nature of suicidal ideation and intrafamilial violence, in many homes the perception of increased safety is 180 degrees off. The emotional health in many homes is just too precarious to have a gun nearby. Regarding gun violence, journalist Stephen Lurie has written, where we worry most, we can help the least, and where we could help the most, we care the least. Predicting a mass shooting uh, tests the limits of science. However, urban violence is much more predictable. Uh, former Mayor Landrieu of New Orleans has said, this is not just a gun issue. It's an unemployment issue. It's a poverty issue. It's a family issue. It's a culture of violence issue. These upstream social determinants of health uh, are at the root of what really needs to be controlled. Now, it's illuminating to note that of the roughly 34,000 Americans who died of gun violence in 2014, 21,000 were suicides and 11,000 were homicides. And of these 11,000 and eight to be exact homicides, only 14 people died in mass shootings. Now since 2014, the death count in mass shootings has uh, risen to as high as 112 last year. Though this still remained less than 1% of all non-suicide gun deaths. The toll on black men stood out with a death rate about 13-fold higher than for white men. In 2014, for every million young adult Americans, 31 white men died of gun violence, 646 black men died of gun violence. Now, this huge disparity should grossly offend our sense of human rights and social justice. So where does this bring us? Well, some people do save their own lives by using a gun for self-defense. We can't deny that. Uh, but others put themselves at higher risk by having a gun in their possession. As a country, we are awash in guns that can fall into the wrong hands at the wrong time. To bring down gun deaths, each community needs an evidence-based strategy informed by local epidemiologic evidence. This is basic applied health. This is what public health practitioners do every day to address AIDS and motor vehicle trauma and teen pregnancy. Now our Ignatian perspective reminds us of the equal dignity of all persons and the primacy of the common good in a society where each person has fundamental rights and duties with respect to his neighbors. While our political and social priorities are subject to discernment, the principle of solidarity with the disadvantaged is core to Catholic social teaching. There is a clear role for evidence-based laws regarding gun ownership, possession, storage, and use. However, without quality epidemiologic data, one can't competently debate rights, benefits, and risks and make informed decisions. Our pluralistic society appears too ideologically diverse to accomplish all that is needed at the national level, and this leaves uh, much work to be done at the state level. The work is not simply governmental leadership or advocacy for new regulations that may or may not produce the desired result. We need intellectual leadership. Now, speaking only for myself, the diverse intellectual skills and energies consolidated in one place like a university, can help harness for individual cities uh, the many uh, aspects of uh, our multidisciplinary requirements for dealing with gun violence. We need to draw upon the best insights from fields including public health, 
clinical health care, education, psychology, sociology, social work, criminal justice, law, political science, communications, informatics, mechanical engineering, mathematical modeling, applied ethics, and business. These are all relevant. And we also have to highlight that the Guns in the Hands of Artists exhibition reaffirmed the value of the visual and performing arts and their ability to provoke us at many levels so that we can contribute uh, to solutions to community problems. Indeed, without cross-sectoral and multidisciplinary partnerships, the crisis of ignorance, which sustains gun violence, will continue as the death toll mounts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, you, you covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time, and, and this is, of course, an incredibly complex uh, topic. And you mentioned a lot of the ways in which it is complex. Um, I'm going to start by talking about how gun violence uh, is not a single thing. Right? As you talked about, there are all sorts of gun violence. There are all sorts of ways that people die from guns. Um, there's domestic violence. There's accidental death. There's suicide. Um, there is mass killing. And um, then there is the kind of violence that we are working with in Chicago, which is really interpersonal and identity-based violence that's happening in racially and economically segregated communities um, where the flow of guns is not um, stemmed ever at all. Um, and these are not legally purchased guns. So when we talk about um, the gun control approaches, um, it's not that those aren't important and relevant, um, but they're not uh, going to touch a lot of the violence that's happening uh, where I'm working. So um, the violence that is killing our children in Chicago is largely based on where people live, who they associate with, who they affiliate themselves with. And so that uh, people are killing their perceived enemies. And people are perceived to be their enemies based on their perceived identity. And um, so when people use the term gang, a lot of different images come to mind. Uh, and, and people maybe think about Chicago as the gangland, you know, Al Capone, the city of Al Capone. Um, what we typically think of as, as gang violence I don't think really captures a lot of what's going on in Chicago currently. Um, so there are many different factors that influence who's going to get shot, who's going to do the shooting. Um, and in terms of a public health approach, we need to uh, take any, any approach that could possibly help. Uh, the one that, that we're focused on is addressing the psychological traumatization that people are walking around with from the gun violence and the other violence that they experience in their lives. So uh, if you've heard of post-traumatic stress disorder, raise your hand. So post-traumatic stress disorder, when people think about PTSD, usually what comes to mind is someone in combat in war. Right? But actually, there are far more people who have PTSD from domestic trauma that they've experienced than from being in combat in the military. Um, and uh, Healing Hurt People Chicago is a program that we brought from Philadelphia. It was developed at Drexel University at the School of Public Health there. Uh, it's a center for nonviolence and social justice. Um, and we've been doing it in Chicago for about five years with uh, young people under 19 
Um, my co-director did some research a few years ago at the Cook County uh, Hospital Trauma Unit, and they found that about 42% of trauma patients and their family members uh, screen positive for PTSD. If the patient was there for a gunshot wound, they were 13 times more likely to screen positive for PTSD than people who were there from a fall or a motor vehicle crash. So we know that these kinds of injuries uh, carry a lot of invisible injury on top of the physical injury. In most settings, when somebody comes in with a, with a physical injury, that injury is treated, and then they are released as soon as they possibly can be from the hospital without any attention to the emotional, psychological, behavioral, spiritual impact of what they've experienced. So the idea of healing hurt people is that when someone comes in with a, with a violent injury, we have an opportunity to, to intervene to address the psychological trauma and then to provide supports and services that could support their recovery from that trauma. And I'll talk a little bit about how that traumatization drives violence, um, but I wanted to give you just a few statistics um, before that. So um, over one half of the patients identified by Healing Her People Chicago had experienced a violent injury prior to the one that brought them to the trauma center. Um, almost 90% had experienced the loss of a family member or a close friend to homicide. 90%. Think about that. And we're working with people under 19. Um, many of the people we work with have been losing people to mm -hmm. this since as long as they can remember. Um, over a third had witnessed a homicide, and about two-thirds had witnessed a shooting or a stabbing. So when they come to the trauma unit with a gunshot wound, it is very often not the most important thing that's happened to them. It's not the worst thing that's happened to them from their perspective. It's simply the last thing that happened to them. And virtually no one that we see has ever been offered any kind of intervention support to recover for any of the violence that they've been dealing with. Uh, in addition to these uh, exposures to violence, they also are dealing with all kinds of other adversity. It, raise your hand if you've heard of something called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. So, <laughs> Somehow I knew your hand would go up, Dr. Kelly. This is a study that was done about 20 years ago, and I'm not going to get into detail about it, but it looked at 10 types of what they called household dysfunction, abuse, neglect, uh, alcoholism or drug addiction in the home, someone in the home being incarcerated, uh, parental separation and loss. And what they found is that the more different types of adversity a person had experienced, the higher their risk for all sorts of bad outcomes later in life. Is that a fair summary? Mm -hmm. So um, in that original ACEs study 20 years ago, and there's just a study that came out um, recently that is showing that this is much more pronounced in uh, people in uh, ethnic minority communities or people with lower incomes. Um, but in that study, about 13% of the people had experienced three or more ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, by the time they were 18 years old. Our Healing Hurt People clients who are, as I said, under 19, so some of them haven't even got to 18 yet, 87% have experienced three or more different types of childhood adversity. Um, Two thirds have had four or more and almost half have had five or more. So when we uh, encounter a patient in the hospital, it's safe for us to assume that this is someone who's been dealing with trauma and adversity for a very long time. Um, and 
even though they are injured children, that is not how they're viewed. And the people who come in with the injuries are viewed, assumed to be perpetrators of violence, whether they have been or not. Many have. Um, the, 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 the distinction between a victim and a perpetrator is, uh, in many cases, meaningless distinction, right? Um, you've heard the expression, hurt people hurt people. Um, so um, they're not viewed as children or adolescents. They're not viewed as people with post-traumatic stress disorder. They're viewed as criminals. Um, and one of the things that we've tried to do to help people understand them in a different way is to um, think about how the United Nations def defines a child soldier. A child soldier is defined as any person under the age of 18 who's affiliated with an armed force or armed group in any capacity. So if our children were in Colombia instead of Chicago, they would be child soldiers. In Chicago, we lock them up. Um, the first age of affiliation for those who say they're affiliated, have been affiliated with a street organization or a gang, um, among our clients is age 10. They say the first time they held a gun was when they were 11. Um, so, Instead of focusing on who's pulling the trigger, part of our public health approach needs to be who's putting guns in the hands of children. And when children are traumatized and also in fear for their lives, it shouldn't surprise us when they fire the gun, right? Um, so, The basic idea underlying the Healing Her People model is that one of the main drivers, and as I've said, an ignored driver of the risk for re-injury and for involvement in violence, retaliation, is untreated psychological trauma. And the cycle is you experience trauma, you have the reactions that any of us have after trauma, which is to develop uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or acute stress disorder, and then uh, do things to manage those symptoms. Two things that very frequently are done to manage those symptoms are carrying a weapon and using substances to manage how one is feeling. Both of those things greatly increase the risk for injury. So then you get injured again, and it's a cycle that goes round and round and round. And the idea of healing her people again is to intervene in that cycle when we have that opportunity, when people have just been hurt, and oftentimes uh, maybe they've never been offered any kind of help or support before, but they're maybe open to it if they think maybe this will stop me from ever having to go through this again. Um, so. That's the, that's the cycle that we're trying to interrupt. Um, the idea, and you alluded to this, Dr. Kelly, that a gun is a form of protection is a very powerful idea it's in our culture. We, we, we believe this so strongly that we have people, literally your colleagues, proposing that what we need to do is arm our teachers. Right? This is a crazy idea. <laughs> a gun does not protect you unless you can shoot a bullet out of the air. The people that are shooting our children are not going to stop shooting because they see that they have a gun. They're going to shoot faster because they see that they have a gun. A gun does not deter anyone. The only way it could protect you is if you kill the person who you think is going to kill you first. Right? So this is a very powerful idea, and, and it shouldn't surprise us that our children believe this idea when they are actually um, 
in danger, right? I mean, and a lot of them know they're in danger because they've been hurt. So um, I think that might be a good place for me to turn it over to you, Congressman Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to the, to the additional conversation. Well, thank you. That's from the wise to the unwise. Um, what, I, what I can bring to the table is not expertise in, in any particular academic discipline or, uh, or research, but a sense for the challenge, the political challenge that we have in dealing with the uh, unbelievable problem of gun violence. Um, and let, let, let me restate a couple of things that, that both professors said very, very clearly. We have a severe and underappreciated problem in this country. What do I mean by that? 33, 34,000 dead Americans every single year, underappreciated. Every 18 months, we lose as many people to gun violence in this country as we lost in the 12 years of the Vietnam War, a thing that split our country and was generational in its impact. We just went through the uh, anniversary of 9-11 in which we lost 3,000 Americans. Uh, we lose that every single month to gun violence. And he, we have known um, for about 700 years, since about 1400, and I say this at Fairfield University, a, a place of inquiry, in about 1400 we figured out that if you had a problem, rather than necessarily just praying to the gods, one good way to deal with that problem was to study it and understand it. And once you understood it, you could come to conclusions about its causes and, 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 and address the problem. And we've put that scientific method and that spirit of inquiry to work against our problems for a very, very long time. We did it in a, in a somewhat analogous world in uh, automobile deaths. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we had massive numbers of automobile deaths because the kids were in the back seat without seat belts and there weren't child seats and we studied it and we saved literally hundreds of thousands of lives over time. The political situation is such that there are those who have a very deliberate interest in stopping us, stopping us from studying this problem and in fact, as Dr. Kelly uh, alluded to, the Congress in 1996, in a colorfully named amendment, the Dickey Amendment, um, ruled that the CDC could not advocate for uh, gun safety or gun control. And that was interpreted. It didn't forbid research, but helpfully, Congress, uh, every time the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, this is the federal agency that is very, very good on things that kill people, whether it's Zika or HIV or, or other issues that kill a lot of people, um, be, when they undertook uh, research around gun violence, um, Congress unhelpfully would cut their budget by the exact amount of money that they spent on that gun violence. And um, I would suggest that in addition to the 700 year lesson of studying something to understand it and to help solve the problem, um, just because you understand a problem doesn't necessarily mean you need to wade into a political firestorm. For example, let me give you an example to illustrate what I mean. If it turns out, as I suspect that it would, that a very substantial number of gun deaths happen when an individual who is not the owner of a gun uses that gun, policemen die because in a scuffle, a criminal takes the policeman's gun and kills the policeman. Uh, son or daughter commits suicide with dad's gun. Guns get stolen. If it turns out, as I imagine it might, that an awful lot of Americans die when a non-owner uses a gun, why don't we have the technology that allows me to use my thumbprint to open this phone? If I leave this phone here, there's not one of you who can get into my phone. And yet, if I leave a gun here, all of you can use it. My point being, obviously, that we don't need to get into the absurd debate over the Second Amendment, over whether you're pro-gun or anti-gun, to say, hey, if the facts show that non-gun owners are actually committing a lot of violence, let's, let's address that. Um, that's just an example um, to illustrate. So the good news is, and I, and I clutch at these little examples of good news, little though they may be in terms of federal action around gun violence, in the 2018 um, Appropriations Act, what was known as the Omnibus, Congress made it clear that the CDC could study the problem. Okay, good, that's the wisdom of 700 years ago. Um, and my hope is that as a result, we will come to learn those things that, that drive violence. And once we know the facts, we can apply the norms, the thinking. 
I suspect that a country with a history of the Second Amendment and, and our gun culture will arrive at a different place than the British or the Canadians uh, or the Germans or the Japanese arrive at. And as a result, we will probably always have more gun violence in those countries. But the point is, we can choose once we have the facts and we can choose wisely. There's two problems here, and this is, this is where, where I will wrap up. Um, one is, um, even though there was this tiny little bit of progress, we have a lot of work to do to really understand this problem. Um, and even if we understand this problem, the human species is not very good at, at evaluating and feeling risk. So the examples, I feel better with a gun in my bedside table. Look, at some visceral level, I can feel that. Um, but of course, the facts show that a gun in my bedside table actually puts me in a position of, of risk. And we see this in plenty of other areas, right? Nobody f fears jumping into their car and driving down to get a gallon of milk, and everybody fears getting on an airplane. You're not gonna die in an airplane, you are gonna die in your automobile. You know, that's, that is the reality. Um, nobody fears the kinds of diets that most assuredly will kill you, and yet you fear lightning and bugs and snakes. So we don't evaluate risk viscerally very well. We don't feel it well. And so just having the facts doesn't necessarily say that we will move in the right direction legislatively or as a moderate matter of policy. One of the big surprises of my 10 years in public policy is that um, it's pretty easy to deny inconvenient facts and to set aside truth for some period of time if it conflicts with your faith, if it confl conflicts with your sense of meaning, um, if you know, you're gonna be pretty hard to persuade some people that they won't be the one that stops that robber or the rapist that is coming up the stairs at one in the morning. Now, we can, there's been some fascinating studies about how good trained law enforcement is when they discharge their weapons in stressful situations. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but suffice it to say that when trained law enforcement officers in moments of stress discharge their weapons, shooting at somebody in a presumably mortal situation, they hit their intar intended target about 12% of the time. So you can imagine what untrained Jim Himes, what his rate of success is going to be um, pr protecting himself with that assailant who's coming up the stairs. But nonetheless, it's in the political world, the one thing I have to add to this debate, it, it, you know, it's often as much feeling and visceral and bias as it is fact and truth, especially in a world where, and this is, this is the, really the sort of interesting public policy thing, Those who oppose reasonable gun safety policies understand that at all costs they must stop a reasonable debate. Because a reasonable debate will surface the fact that, and I work in a representative body, that 90% of Americans support universal background check. This is not a complicated idea. This is the idea that we're, yeah, it's, it's not a complicated idea. Everybody, regardless of when or where you buy a weapon, should be uh, undergo a background check to make sure you're not a violent felon or a terrorist or anything else. Um, the reason that is opposed is because once you start down that track of things that make sense, you might take up other ideas that make sense. <laughs> and the NRA and other uh, gun groups at all costs need to stop that it might make sense argument. Because again, it's hard to penetrate when we're talking about risk. Again, we, we, you know, we fear the flying that won't kill us against the bacon double cheeseburger that will kill us. <laughs> Um, but if you start down that path of rational inquiry, you move in directions that aren't convenient. And by the way, and this is my, this is my last point, we're not even to the point where we can get to good answers. We're not asking the right questions, and that's not an accident. What's the question I get asked and you get asked most, I bet, out there? Are you pro-gun or anti-gun? That's an insane question. We don't ask that about any other technology. Are you pro-car or anti-car? Are you pro-opiates or anti-opiates? I, I use those examples because most people would say, well, I'm anti-opiates. Yeah, but opiates are an important part of pain management for a lot of people. Cars, yeah, cars kill a lot more people than guns do. 
but you know, we don't say we're anti-car. So even accepting the language of are you pro-gun or anti-gun is a useful way by asking the wrong question of stopping inquiry, evidence, and arriving at smart consensus answers. Whenever somebody asks me that, are you pro-gun or anti-gun, I say, look, you know, we got a Second Amendment. I actually respect hunters. I'm even going to give up on the fight of that individual who thinks that a weapon is good for self-protection. All I want to do is make sure that individual is storing that weapon safely. So that's a reasonable discussion, but it's not one you can have if we start with the question of are you pro-gun or anti-gun. So the forces who would stop us from understanding this problem, this unique problem in the United States, have gone further than just stopping us from the inquiry. And again, there was that little bit of progress we made last year. They've got us asking the wrong questions. So our challenge is, how do we start asking the right questions if we take it for granted that we have a Second Amendment, and we do, and if we take it for granted that there are a lot of people who like hunting, and we do, how can we focus on those things, easy things, like I was talking about you know, safe gun technology, maybe slightly harder things, like the conversation about what kinds of weapons are appropriate for hunting uh, and for personal protection. Again, we're gonna draw the line somewhere. Um, we can have those conversations if we reject the, the refusal to enter into a reasoned discussion, to ask the questions that make sense and, and, and reject the fear and reject um, the kind of um, anger and emotionality and division that stops the right questions from being asked and ultimately the right questions from being answered. So if I might, I know that you're going to ask some questions, but uh, it, this is one question that I think is probably a, a, a right question to ask that none of us mentioned, and that is money. So uh, there are economic drivers to some of this, right? And there is money being spent to perpetuate the problem. Um, so, if we're not spending anywhere close to that to try to prevent the problem, how do we ever think that we have any chance of succeeding? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, sometimes um, I have to get in front of the argument that the NRA, because they spend a ton of money lobbying, um, that, they're, that that's the problem. It's actually a bigger problem than that. Look, the NRA, like every other organization, is limited in the amount of money they can give to federal candidates anyway. And it's not a big, no I mean, it's not a big number relative to the cost of a campaign. The NRA, I guess, can give somebody $5,000, but in a world where campaigns cost $3 million, that's not a hugely significant thing. What the NRA has done, and I realized this when I finally, you know, had two glasses of wine and watched 45 minutes of NRA videos. <laughs> um, what they're doing is they are, it's a very sophisticated and dark thing. They are um, using the culture war to move people in a way that they could never move people with $5,000 contributions. Do it, again, have a glass of wine, but watch, watch a bunch of NRA videos. Those coastal, elitist, Hollywood, Manhattan, San Francisco types hate your way of life and want to take away your guns. If you notice, the word gun only came up once in that, in that sort of summary of a lot of these videos. We are in a very divided society today. Oftentimes, those lines are drawn between more urban coastal areas and more rural areas. And the NRA has really capitalized on this sense of societal and even cultural division to create a sense of those anti-gun people, and again, notice the language, anti-gun, are you anti-car? They, they hate your way of life and they want to change it. So, so in some ways, yes, the money matters, but the extent to which they've been able to harness the cultural divisions and the culture war in this country to their own ends is really dramatic to see. I was also thinking about uh, other ways that, that uh, corporations may profit from uh, our gun problem. And I don't just think about gun manufacturers, but also about the uh, incarceration uh, industry. Yeah, that's, that's unquestionably part of it. I mean, look, the NRA gets its operating budget from a lot of gun companies. There's no, there's no question about that. But um, 
Um, and so yes, that is also um, a driver here um, that we should be cognizant of. And you know, look, the automobile companies resisted, you know, like mad the introduction of seat belts, but. Over time, if you do the inquiries, if you get the answers, and if you push people and do it in a way that brings people on board rather than exacerbating the split, the auto companies eventually make airbags and, and seatbelts standard equipment. <laughs> Thank you. So now's the time to uh, write those questions down, and there are folks coming around uh, to collect them. Um, I guess one question I had is, is let's assume funding is restored um, to, the, to the CDC. Um, what are some of the key research questions? What are the, the top few that you would want to um, see explored? I, I guess um, one uh, assumption that I would uh, wonder if the congressman would comment about is the um, omnibus bill uh, allowed the CDC if I remember the verbiage right, to investigate the causes of gun violence. Uh, I'm not sure, correct me if I'm wrong, that any money was appropriated to go along Sorry. with that um, allowance to investigate the causes. And in the gun violence research community, there's a little bit of angst about the way that was worded, because we not only want to understand the causes, but we want to understand the interventions that may be effective against gun violence. And so um, some of the folks like Daniel Webster at, at Johns Hopkins or Garen Wintemoot uh, in, uh, at the University of California are not exactly jumping for joy. These are you know, national leaders in, in this type of research because they, they think that um, the money is not going to show up, basically, and that, in fact, if it does show up, uh, they will be held to only doing research on causes. Now, um, to continue with your answering your question, uh, when I was introduced, I was, um, it was noted that I was involved with a study that uh, was entitled Priorities for Research to Reduce the Threat of Firearm-Related Violence. Now, this was a study requested by President Obama in the aftermath of Sandy Hook. Uh, President Obama basically said that the CDC uh, was misinterpreting the Dickey Amendment uh, verbiage and that, in fact, they could do gun violence-related research. And uh, the question was, what should that research be? And they came to the National Academy of Science, and we gave them an expert committee's rendition on what the research could be. So I could give you a whole long list of that. But what was frustrating for me is we gave them this wonderful list of research and uh, no money ever showed up uh, to actually conduct it. So we kind of felt we were uh, spinning our wheels. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, ex that's, a, that's exactly right. The Dickey Amendment never said you can't do research. The, the Dickey Amendment said you can't do advocacy. But as I said, um, Congress also unhelpfully, every time the CDC undertook or sponsored some research, uh, Congress ke kept track of it and reduced uh, um, the 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 funding for the CDC. Right. So um, and, and look, I think I, I think if there's if there's a lesson here, if if we can get our friends, uh, uh, you know, who are who are skittish about, you know, all the anti-gun people out there, look, options. We live in a democracy. Developing options isn't determinative. If we have twelve things that you through your research, tell us will dramatically reduce gun violence. We're not compelled to do them. And in fact, if four of them are politically and unviable, let's do the other eight. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a reasonable man. I, I, <laughs> I, I think there are just some who are even scared at the CDC to do this research because they feel that um, the words uh, advocate or promote gun control are kind of fuzzy, ambiguous words, and that the generation of knowledge uh, w might lead to an obvious conclusion of something you should do, and that would be the equivalent of promoting gun control. I, I think in the, in the first place, my recollection is that when Congressman Dickey proposed that amendment, it was in reaction to some of the research I shared with us tonight on uh, the dangers of having a gun in the home. Uh, 
people like Art Kellerman showed that if you have a gun in the home, it increases the risk of suicide and uh, 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 intrafamilial uh, killing. And those facts, which I think were presented as facts, were interpreted almost as part of advocacy. There was, and, and that's what scares some people at CDC. They're afraid that if they do anything that has a whiff of uh, supporting uh, something like gun control, they'll be punished for it. Yeah, but look, this is, this, it's a political management problem. I'm the only person up here without a PhD, but, <laughs> but I, I, I suspect it's true that gun violence involves guns, and I suspect it's true that if we had fewer guns, we'd have less gun violence. I'm just guessing. But, but so, okay, you know, that makes the, and again, I hate the language, but that makes the pro-gun people pretty uncomfortable. Maybe it's not um, politically viable to say we should have fewer guns and, and you know, the Congress in its infinite wisdom passed a bill th two years ago which, which protected the Second Amendment rights of people who uh, had been adjudicated mentally incompetent through the Social Security system. Uh, and so that is, at least for the very near term, you know, fewer guns in people's hands, probably off the table, but there's a vast array of other recommendations. Again, I talked about safe gun technology. Um, you, know, you know, can we be thoughtful about particular contexts that are dense with violence? You know, is it true, as this non-PhD might surmise, that in bars that allow guns, there's probably a disproportionate share of violence? You know, there, there are other things that we can do. Yeah. I'm going to get in some questions from our from our audience now, um, and kind of take it back to the social emotional question. So one of the questions we have is: Do social emotional education and anger management um, uh, approaches in public schools have the potential for reducing gun violence? And maybe that's a question for you, uh, Bradley, to start with. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the brevity. <laughs> the the better uh, people are able to regulate their emotions and their behavior in response to those emotions, the less violent they will be. And um, now if their dysregulation is related to how traumatized they are, then those kinds of techniques are not necessarily going to get to them, right? Because they're not aimed at the right part of the brain. Um, but there are a lot of things that are done in those social emotional learning um, types of approaches that just have to do with self-regulation. There's meditation in schools, there's yoga in schools, um, and, and those sorts of things absolutely could help people to not be as violent. Uh, most violence is reactive. Um, it, that is, it is in response to some perceived threat or slight. So if people had a, a, a better way to regulate when they feel afraid or disrespected, then they probably would be less likely to act violently. Thank you. And uh, we have a question here that um, I uh, assume came from, from one of our students in the audience. Um, I want to get involved. Um, so I went to the March for Our Lives, but what is next? How effective are things like the March for Our Lives? And what are some other proactive activities that students can do to enact change? Let me start on that one since I'm sort of the recipient of advocacy and, and watch this closely. N number one, don't, don't let it fade. Um, this is a problem that is going to be solved very sadly over a long period of time. Um, some, problem, some, some change in our society happens dramatically rapidly. I would point to uh, the speed with which our gay friends acquired marriage equality rights. Some things really happen painfully over a long period of time, civil rights in the 1960s with all the associated violence and steps back. We're, uh, gun violence is more in the second category. Um, so, so, so you know, keep the faith, keep working hard. Don't, don't assume that it doesn't make a difference. Florida, of all places, the state that has stand your ground gun laws after Parkland actually raised the age, and I know this is a small thing, but it's progress, raised the age for the purchase of an assault weapon. Um, 
very small, but let's celebrate what little progress we see in this. So keep it up. Keep up the advocacy. Really remember that this is a, that this is a marathon, not a sprint. And secondarily, and this is something I talk. My wife Mary is very involved in in um, in unload and and in um, and in really thinking through how we get people to have a conversation that gets to the right questions and gets to a reasonable. Um, a, a reasonable solution. Remember, a reasonable solution is a good solution for those of us who are concerned about gun violence. And I would offer this, again, I don't have a lot of expertise, but this is one of them. Um, this is an area in which, like in politics and in marriage, it's actually better to be persuasive than to be right. And um, if the objective is to change people's minds, we need to be careful about how we engage them. And so I can't tell you the thousands of times every year that I see a, and again, I hate the language, an anti-gun and a pro-gun person just going at it. You're stupid. That's the dumbest thing. Don't you understand? You're, you're a lot less safe with a gun. Yeah, but you're anti-gun. You don't care about the second. That is not a persuasive conversation. And so I would suggest that if you want to be a black belt in changing people's minds, you got to go to where they are. You got to try to get inside their heads and understand why they're coming from where they are. And in, and in some cases, it's actually a, a maybe slightly foreign but legitimate place. You know, if you grew up in Pennsylvania, like I, in rural Pennsylvania, like I did not, that moment when you go out hunt deer hunting for the first time is the rural Pennsylvania equivalent of a bar mitzvah, right? I mean, it is a seminal moment. And that is intricately linked to guns. And so, how, how do they get the Torah out? <laughs> <laughs> I'm being a little loose in my language here, aren't I? My point is that we that if we're going to try to be persuasive with people, um, uh, fighting with them is a step backwards, not a step forward. Um, this is a question for for Dr. Stolback. Um, gun rights advocates point to the fact that Chicago is called a gun-free city. Yet thousands of Chicagoans are wounded and hundreds killed by guns every year. Where are the guns coming from and who is profiting from smuggling guns into the city? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Uh, where, and, and, and it's a question that never gets asked. It's not about uh, how do we stop the guns from coming in. It's about uh, what do we do to the person who we think is going to pull the trigger or who pulled it? Um, and then we don't even follow up on that. I mean, the clearance rate of homicides in Chicago is 17%. The clearance rate of shootings is lower than that. So, uh, but I do know that I haven't yet met the 12 year old with the gun factory in his basement. So it depends who you ask um, and how much they buy into conspiracy theories and things like that. But the guns that are, that are ending up in our children's hands are not uh, legally acquired guns for the most part. So that's why having the gun laws that we have in Chicago doesn't really affect this problem. And the problem that you're highlighting that we don't know how the guns got there reflects the uh, lack of, uh, of data that we have about being able to track how guns move around. Uh, referring back to the data vacuum I mentioned before, uh, there are just so many basic questions that we can't attempt to answer uh, because we don't have um, the databases, certainly at the national level, now, there are a number of states that uh, uh, have moved beyond um, you know, what you can do at the national level. And I really think the future of progress in the short term is going to be at, at the state level. Uh, and I think, um, I think university students can really mobilize uh, to create uh, interest groups that uh, through service learning could help communities understand uh, the epidemiology of, of uh, gun-related violence in their communities. I'm not sure that uh, many mayors in Connecticut really understand uh, what the full characteristics of gun violence are in their communities, what the risk factors are, what the protective factors are, uh, and that kind of thing. And uh, I think students from all kinds of disciplines could 
contribute. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to any of you about that. Uh, but uh, you represent uh, in one room an incredible diversity of expertise. Um, and your faculty represents an, ex an incredible diversity. And I think the ultimate solution is not going to come from one discipline, whether it's criminal justice or public health but it really takes all the disciplines to work together. And that's just something that's kind of unique about a university. Uh, you know, we have here uh, people who are in public health. We have people who are in mechanical engineering. We have people who are in <coughs> visual and performing arts. And uh, they all uh, have a role. And I, I think the ultimate solutions have to be somewhat customized to the problem um, in the community. We talk about gun violence and at times the same way we talk about cancer, but cancer is really a whole collection of very different diseases that have different risk factors and different treatments. And you could say the same thing about gun violence. If I want to deal with a suicide problem, which as we noted accounts for about two thirds of the problem, you know, that's a different solution than if we're trying to prevent um, uh, uh, violence within the family that leads to fatalities. Thank you. Um, uh, this picks up on our conversation from last week and, and some of the things that you mentioned, uh, Representative Himes, but Connecticut has some of the strictest gun laws in the country, which is commendable, but our state also has a long history of we weapons manufacturing. Where are we on conversations with gun manufacturers about their responsibilities to the public good on this issue? Um, we're not, um, as you might imagine, um, in the current political configuration making any meaningful progress. There, um, there are at least two fruitful um, avenues one might go here. One is um, to hold, I use the automobile example, right? We started holding automobile companies responsible for the safety of their product. Um, we uh, started going after tobacco companies about the way in which they advertised. Um, and I could go on, liquor companies, you name it. Um, we are not doing that with the gun industry right now in any meaningful way. And if we shifted some of the liability for the mayhem that comes from firearms onto the, uh, onto the firearm companies, um, we would probably make some progress. And the other, the other person we shouldn't forget is the gun owner. Um, you know, again, if we sort of start from the premise that Americans are going to have guns because it's guaranteed in the Second Amendment, um, what can we do to make sure that they are smarter about storing those weapons? And, 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 uh, and again, I keep going back to gun safety technology, making sure that the owner of that weapon exercising their Second Amendment rights isn't also enabling somebody else to commit a terribly violent act. Thank you. So one of our questions is, why do school shootings happen in suburban areas and not urban areas? Well, that's why we need data to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I make a quick observation? Sure. Um, and, and, and this introduces the most uncomfortable conversation we have in this country, which is a race conversation, um, which is that when a lot of young children, white children, are murdered in affluent suburban uh, parts of our country, it attracts a lot more attention than the daily murder of lots of children of color in our urban environments. Well, the statistics I shared, uh, I, I think, you know, bear that out very, very much. I mean, it's the disparity is obscene. <laughs> Uh, when you, but in the inner city communities, it's, it's kind of uh, accepted as the price of being in the inner city, day-to-day -day business. And uh, even, uh, it, it, you're right, it just doesn't collect the same attention. Maybe most of us can't identify with people in those situations. They, they don't have, uh, they don't occur in as large numbers. So. Uh, it, they fly under the radar. But if you look at it cumulatively, uh, it vastly exceeds what happens uh, in mass shootings, whether they're you know, in schools or, or other kinds of settings. And uh, I'm hoping that um, events like this can sensitize us to that. Uh, you're seeing a lot of money put into making 
institutions for well-off people more secure. Uh, I, I can say, and I, I don't, we're not embarrassed by this, but Fairfield is more secure than it used to be. Uh, I'd love to see the same amount of energy put into trying to make inner cities more secure. This is a question for uh, Dr. Stolbeck. Um, what are some of the challenges you face in, um, I guess, getting young people to take, advantages, take advantage of the services that you have to offer? What is that conversation like? Um, the, the challenges actually are more in having adequate resources to be able to really work at engaging everyone. So because our resources are limited, we, um, we aren't able to offer everyone a timely um, service, right? We don't always have someone available right away to work with somebody who might be open to it. Um, a lot of the young people who get involved in the program um, there may be another family member who wants them to do it, um, or someone who cares about them, who doesn't want them to get shot again. Um, sometimes they're interested in the idea that we could help them get a job. That's most, most young people, if you ask them, do you want some therapy, they will say no, um, because there's nothing wrong with them, and they're usually right about that. Um, but if you ask them if they would like a job, they would say uh, yes immediately. So some of the work that we do is, is um, trying to create opportunities for our young people to work with us, and we have a variety of different ways that they do that. Um, uh, one is a glass blowing program, uh, and then we have uh, young people who are employed running um, psychoeducation groups co-facilitating them. We have young people who are employed training medical professionals about how to provide trauma-informed care. Um, so letting people know that you know we might be able to help them get a job is one way. Um, the truth is most of the young people that we work with, if they actually believed that there was another way for them to live safely, they would be very, very happy <laughs> to go along with whatever that is, right? They, um, they don't like being in fear for their lives all the time. So, um, but we really don't know what, what would the uptake be if we had the adequate uh, resources to provide the services. Um, so a question we have is, uh, in lieu of federal action, what can we be doing at the state level um, and the local level to address some of the root causes of gun violence, um, such as gun safety programs, uh, other emotional and social well-being uh, programs, and how do we bring those to scale? Again, it is, uh, the non-PhD will make the obvious comment, which is, <laughs> which, which is, let's identify those communities that have bizarrely low incidents of gun violence and figure out why why it is. I, I'm not sure that today, and I'll, I'll I'll look at the PhDs. I'm not sure today we have a really good sense of what communities are doing a great job reducing gun violence. You hear anecdotally, uh, you know, there's wonderful programs in, uh, in 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 Bridgeport and elsewhere where you have you know ex offenders working with gangs. And so you anecdotally hear things that um, that are that that purport to be reducing violence. But I mean, I think you just posed the question that illustrates why we need to know a lot more than we know about the nature of the violence. Um. You know, I would love to, to, to partner with uh, a small number of communities around here and really try to describe uh, what, or try to learn what we can about the distribution of violence in that community geographically map it. I know in Bridgeport, for example, they have used um, uh, geographic information systems to look at where violence occurs and it's not exactly spread homogeneously across the the city of Bridgeport, and then looking at what are the correlates uh, of that distribution so that you can target um, interventions. Uh, 
I think we need to learn a whole lot more about uh, that targeting. And, and the, I know the Bridgeport Police Department uh, appreciates that. Um, <coughs> Uh, I'd love to give them some help, though, to do it at a more sophisticated level. Um, you know, I think every community is going to need a bit of a customized solution. Um, you know, in, in some communities, the problem is probably more suicide. Uh, and how we approach that, uh, that may, uh, we may need to uh, work with providers in the emergency rooms and in private practitioner offices to better screen for um, or help them screen better for uh, patients who are at risk. Um, I think we, if we learned a lot, we could, uh, we could identify programs that would be worthy of scaling up. Uh, right now, uh, I'm not sure that we know enough to necessarily scale up um, a lot of uh, a lot of things, I think you know. It, it, again, it, as as your answer suggests, it's it's a very complicated uh, problem, and there isn't a one answer. So it really depends in what context does what approach work. Um, but I would say, in general, for the the, the communities that I'm serving. Um, Taking care of people would would be the intervention, right? So people are sick; they need medical care. Um, having people living in communities where there's enough food for everyone to actually eat, and that there's a, a livable wage that people can survive on. Uh, the money that they earn, um, those kinds of interventions would, would make a big difference. And there's certainly less violence in communities where uh, people know where their next meal is coming from. So this question is, um, during the three opening statements, no one mentioned gun violence is perpetuated by law enforcement. Um, and where does this come into play, and how can we be working with law enforcement on this issue? I would just say that everything I said about the young people we work with being traumatized and how that uh, may drive their um, the likelihood that they will uh, react violently applies to anyone with a gun in their hand. Um, so the idea that that uh, police who kill black people are doing it because they're racist, right? Which is the, I mean, that's usually the question. Is a racist cop, was he a racist? Where are you now we have Jason Van Dyke on trial in Chicago. This is the first trial, a, a murder case for a, an on-duty police officer killed a child um, in decades in the city of Chicago. Um, and they want to say, is he racist? He's not a racist. It doesn't matter. Uh, that police department has a long history of torturing and killing black people. And this is documented. I'm not saying anything that's not known. So, but if you have people working in, a, in a, uh, an institution like that, and they're also traumatized, and you don't want them to shoot people who don't need to be shot, which is just about everyone, then uh, you should probably try to address their trauma. But the police are not allowed to acknowledge any kind of um, emotional difficulty, any difficulty with their work. Um, so that, that's one factor. Thank you. So I'm, I'm conscious we're, we're coming to a close here. And, and a lot of the questions that are coming in uh, are pretty much, what can we do? Um, and so I wonder, in closing, if, if each of you could share um, you know, in a brief sentence or two, if it, what would you recommend for the people walking out of the room today who want to take some action to be involved? Um, what can they do? 
Well, uh, I think, um, I hate to keep beating a dead horse, but uh, one thing that we need is solid quality information that fully allows communities to understand their problem. Uh, we uh, are hopeful that the CDC can uh, do what they've done for other forms of injury and, um, and AIDS and communicable diseases and fully describe the distribution determinants of gun violence as well as they do for these other things. Uh, they have been embarrassingly stifled from doing that for about 20 years. Um, if each state can uh, follow on, uh, we're not talking huge amounts of money. The CDC is only looking for, I think, $10 million, which uh, is in the grander scheme of things is pretty modest. Um, but that would go far in building the databases so that we were acting not only from our hearts, uh, but also in a, uh, an evidence-based uh, way. Uh, I, um, I think uh, we have to uh, not only advocate in a general way, a lot of people are advocating in a general way, but advocate for some very specific uh, things like that at the national level and uh, hopefully also investments at the uh, state level uh, to replicate that. I think we'll be able to move faster at the state level. So I, it, the answer for me is it, it depends. It depends who you are, what resources you have, who you're connected to, and, and uh, who, who will listen to you. Um, but one thing that you all can do is vote. And uh, it's really not adequate to vote just yourself. You need to get everyone that you know to vote. Um, that's, I mean, the biggest problem with our democracy is that the majority of people are not participating in it. So um, things would look a lot different if they did. That was my line. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let, let, let me throw out a, so uh, I don't want to say what I said before, which is not just vote, but continue the advocacy, keep pushing, don't lose heart, be energized by the Parkland students, you know, just, just just don't lose heart. But let me let me say something a little different, and I, I have to say it carefully, because I, I, I don't, it is, it, it, it is dangerous to trade in gender stereotypes, but the issue of gender hasn't come up tonight, and yet it is there. Um, one gender is perpetrating the vast bulk of gun violence. And for better or for worse in our society, one gender is still uh, overrepresented in raising children and, 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 and that sort of thing. And so I really do believe that women have a particularly powerful role to play today. Let me just give two examples. One is one that you've heard before, which is if every single, and again, I don't mean to trade in gender stereotypes, so let me just use parent. If every parent were to say as their child went off to a play date at the neighbors, is there a gun in the house? And if the answer to that question is yes, to have a conversation that whatever follows based on your, you know, it would, the notion of guns as a public safety risk would permeate our society more than it does today. Again, if I can go back to the dangerous realm of gender, but gender is there, um, you know, their guns are, inevitably associated with a sense of power and machismo. And I think if women would begin to reject that, and young women, when they get invited out on a date with a guy who wants to show the gun has in the car, get out of the darn car. You know, reject the notion that a man is somehow more manly if he is armed. So again, I, conscious as I am of how dangerous ground that is to tread, I do think that women have a unique role here in changing the way our culture thinks about uh, firearms. So uh, that brings us to a close tonight. Um, thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panelists one more time.